صلوات بر محمد والی محمد اٹھ گیا باپ کا سر سے سایا اٹھ گیا باپ کا سر سے سایا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی گھر میں فرش ازا بچھ گیا ہے خانے رب میں ماتم بپا ہے سوگ میں ڈوبا گھر سیدہ کا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی رو رہے ہیں یہ محراب و ممبر کہہ رہے ہیں یہ جبریل رو کر ابن ملجم نے یہ ظلم ڈھایا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی عرش پر مصطفیٰ رو رہے ہیں سب کے سب انبیاء رو رہے ہیں ہے فرشتوں میں کوہرام برپا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی کوئی کلسو کو دے دلاسا اور تڑپتی ہے غم سے خدیجہ مولا باس کرتے ہیں نوحا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو کتنے ہیں لوگ کوفے میں سے جس کے مولا نے دکھ درد باٹے چھن گیا آج ان کا مسیحہ آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم اٹھ رہا ہے جنازہ علی کا اٹھ رہا ہے جنازہ علی کا ایک محشر کا عالم ہے برپا سب کے ہوتوں پہ ہے ایک نوحا آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی آج زینب یتیم ہو گئی سلوات در محمد والی محمد My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just a reminder that tomorrow's program will start at 6.30 p.m. 
with Quran Khani and again the lecture and the amaz will be after Salat as it was yesterday. Let us invite Shaykh with a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so brothers want to be able to move forward and allows those coming a little bit later to have easy space inshallah. Please open your Qur'ans to Surah At-Talaq, chapter number 65 of the Holy Qur'an, verse number 1. And thereafter we will need Surah An-Nisa, chapter number 4, verses 34 and 35. Chapter number 4, verse 34, and verse number 35. For the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahi rahmani rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Alhamdulillah al-lazhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen khatam al-nabiyyin sayyidin al-mumajjad bashirin al-musaddaq al-mustafa al-amjad mahmud al-ahmad abil qasimi muhammad Allahumma وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي إذا طلقتم النساء فطلقوهن لعدتهن وأحصل عدة واتقوا الله ربكم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوا على محمد وآل محمد Awaited Savior of Humanity Imam Al-Mahdi عليه السلام My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing on in our discussions of the commentary of Surat At-Talaq, especially in the vein of seeing Surat At-Talaq as a means of preserving the family unit. In our opening few discussions, we have been looking at the idea of prevention is better than cure. That if we can even prevent the potential of divorce or separation, it is better than having to try to cure the problem once marital dispute has arisen between the two partners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates this in one word which we have been focusing on on the last few days. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayyuhan Nabi, Ida Tallaqtumun Nisa'a. When you have decided to divorce, meaning that there is still time before this. And as a result, we've been looking at four principles that may help us to ensure that we don't need to ever go down this route, insha'Allah. Number one, positive socialization as a means to help people learn how to navigate differences of one another. As a child, the more you are exposed to different types of people, and see the way people positively treat one another, the more that becomes part and parcel of your nature and your development. Number two, we have to learn to be able to deal with our own traumas before we enter into marriage. It may be that we have inherited a cultural trauma, a familial trauma, a personal issue has arrived. We need to seek out expertise, it could be mental health, it could be spiritual guidance that helps us to overcome those issues 
so that we don't bring them into our family unit to come. Third and fourth, we spoke about in brief last night, that spouse selection has been heavily discussed by the Qur'an in Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and the guidance is given that we should be looking for people who are spiritually inclined, have good characteristics, and that we match with them well, and not we are choosing them on the basis of fleeting wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah fleeting characteristics such as money, wealth or reputation and then the fourth was that when we have a strong contract between the two parties then what they expect from one another is clear and that if ever, God forbid, there is a dispute then we can revert back to the contractual agreements those contractual agreements have to be in line with Quran and Sunnah and cannot be against Qur'an and Sunnah as per the hadith of Imam alayhi salam where he is narrated to have said Al-Mu'minun inda shurutihim illa ma khalaf al-Qur'an wa sunnah The Mu'mineen are allowed to make conditions upon one another except where they disagree or conflict with the Qur'an and Sunnah of Ahlul Bayt Salawat Allah wa salamuhu alayhi majma'een These are four ways that we can establish good support in advance of entering into the marriage itself. Today, inshallah, we will conclude ayah number one from the surah itself. And what you will find is that there are several ways that the verse itself, one verse, seeks to preserve the family unit even, even when divorce has been decided and determined upon. Most people imagine that once divorce has been decided, the two parties have made a decision, or the man has made the decision, for example, or the woman on her own has made the decision, for example. Even then, there is still great preservation of the family unit, potential for reconciliation. Even further, even if the pronunciation of the sira for the talaq has been recited, there is still opportunity to preserve the marriage and the family unit. In one ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us around five stages and ways to preserve it, even at the point of when the decision has been made. Have a read of the ayah with me, and we'll try to discuss these stages and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents this subject to us. Look at how one verse of the Qur'an has so much depth to it. You see, we have become very accustomed to reading the Qur'an quickly, to try to finish the Qur'an as quickly as possible. And there is merit in finishing the Qur'an in Shahr Ramadan, in any other time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala packs in so much wisdom it is better for us to read the Qur'an in slow, measured portions. That we take time to think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Have a look at this ayah, read it with me. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhan Nabi, O Prophet, Ida talaktumun nisa'a When you have decided to divorce a woman, فَطَلِّقُوهُنَّ Then, divorce. For the prescribed period of Idda. Wa ahsul Idda. And don't just guess the Idda. Count the days of the Idda period. Wattakullaha Rabbakum. And be extremely God conscious of your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La tukhrijuhunna min bayutihinna. And do not expel that person that is being divorced from their houses. And they should not be driven out of their houses, nor they themselves leave their houses, unless they have committed an open indecency. This is the only time this should occur. وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the boundaries 
the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهُ And whoever goes beyond the boundaries, the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he has done an injustice to his own soul. لَا تَدْرِي لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يُحْدِثُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ أَمْرًا You do not know that Allah may after this still bring about reunion and reconciliation between the two of you. In every stage of this verse, there is opportunity to preserve the marriage. At face value, it appears that Allah is saying, okay, this is how you divorce. Actually, what is being given an indirect understanding is, this is how you preserve the marriage. <laughs> Can you imagine? Let's show you this from the ayah itself. And you'll see that when you look at the ayah of the Quran, it is eye-opening as to how Allah is actually guiding us in every stage. Ya ayyuhan nabi, idha talaqtumun nisa. So we have stated, idha, there is much opportunity for preservation. How? If we make sure in advance, we are well prepared for the marriage. فَطَلِّقُوهُنَّ لِعِدَّتِهِنَّ Then, you must only perform the talaq at the prescribed time. When is the prescribed time? It is after the period of menstruation. So if the divorce is pronounced and menstruation has not yet started, that divorce is invalidated. It is batil. The prescription or the, the pronouncement of the talaq and the starting of this can only occur after the menstruation has occurred. Why? Because in that period of time, there is still opportunity for reconciliation, number one. And number two, it might be that we find out that there is a pregnancy that is occurring in that period. So let us just make it clear as an example. Let us say we are in the middle of the month. The menstruation is not to start for two more weeks, as an example. Even if you have determined on the talaq, it does not begin until when? After the menstruation. So you still have the two weeks until, for example, menstruation starts, and then ten days after. As an example, three weeks. In that period, that extended period, there is still opportunity to find reconciliation. But even in that two weeks, you might find that no menstruation takes place. Why? Because there is pregnancy. And of course, the moment a husband and wife find out that there is life, that they are bringing a new life into the world, it changes things, doesn't it, from their perspective. You will find every reason to continue a marriage, even if it's for yourselves, let alone for the child to be, inshallah. Can you see? So every opportunity is being given in this word. So look, even these two words, فَطَلِّقُوهُنَّ لِعِدَّتِهِنَّ But perform the divorce from when? From that prescribed time, after the menstruation or from the point of menstruation. So another opportunity. So the first way, إِذَا gives you an opportunity to find ways to help the marriage forward. Number two, إِدَّتِهِنَّ وَحْصُلْ إِدَّةِ وَأَحْصُلْ إِدَّةِ And count the number of days. Why? The menstruation period here or the idda the period here is how many? Three or one, three cycles. Why? Because again, in these three cycles, you might find that pregnancy comes. There might be something that changes the cycle. And even in this period, you might find that pregnancy comes. Again, it's another opportunity to find reconciliation. So how long? The first period of waiting. Then the second period of waiting, which is three cycles. Four whole months goes by how much opportunity there is to be able to talk and to speak and to find reconciliation with your partner. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ رَبَّكُمْ لَا تُخْرِجُوهُنَّ مِنْ بَيُوتِهِنَّ Do not expel them, do not remove your partner, your wife, from the house. Interestingly, Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam have explained that this is also for the opportunity to continue on with the marriage itself. Think about this. If someone leaves the house 
and goes back to their familial home, it is more likely, or rather it is less likely that you have communication with that person. But if that person is still with you and you are still with that person in the same house and you have to see each other, there is more opportunity for communication to be able to reconcile the marriage with one another. Sometimes someone from their family or home doesn't come very far. Sometimes someone's family or home may be the other side of the world. If they go back to their family or home on the other side of the world, imagine how limited the opportunity for contact is. Furthermore, it may be that other people start pouring things into the ear. They say this, they say that, they bring up this problem, they bring up that problem. In your heart, you want to find reconciliation. Someone else may be in your ear saying something different to you. Whereas if you remain within the family home and you're seeing your partner on a daily basis, you might find that there's more opportunity to reconcile the differences that have arisen. In fact, not only this, Ahlul Bayt have explicitly in their ahadith given the recommendation for the husband and the wife in that period of time to find ways of becoming more attractive to one another. So that you invoke the potential of reconciliation. Hadith comes to us from our Holy Prophet Muhammad al Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, in this period of time, the ayah says, don't expel your wife from the house. He says, you don't leave the house. You don't, and actually at that time, some men, they used to seclude themselves inside the masjid of the Prophet. He says, don't do this. You stay at home and don't go seclude yourself away. Same thing can happen. You leave, people can start poisoning your ear. You leave, you might find other reasons to leave. Can you see? In fact, Imam al Qadim alayhi salam says that it's better that you, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, that you should dye your hair. He was talking, or actually the companion noticed the Imam had dyed his hair. He said, Yes, I want to look young for my wife. I want to look good for my wife. He says, This keeps us both together. On the other side, not only is there recommendation for the man, there is also recommendation for the woman. Hadith comes to us from our fifth holy Imam, Muhammad al-Baqir, salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. A divorced woman staying at her ex-husband's home is supposed to wear makeup, perfume, and wear beautiful clothes so that they may make decisions with further insight and the husband may thereby revoke the divorce and they may resume their married life. Both sides, there is recommendation to take care of oneself and make themselves more presentable for the other. Look at the ayah. لا تخرجهن من بيوتهن So do not expel them from their houses. ولا يخرجن And do not, um, nor should they themselves leave إلا أن يأتينا بفاحشة مبينة nor should they themselves go forth out of the house unless there has been a fahisha mubayyina, open zina has been committed. Na'udhu billah. Wa tilka hudud Allah. These are the limits of Allah. Wa man yata'addad hudud Allah faqad zalama nafsah. Whoever uh, disobeys, goes beyond these limits of Allah, then they have done an injustice to their own soul. You see, it speaks to both man and woman. Whoever. So one party can break the limits of Allah. You have done wrong to your own soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So, so far, there is idha. There is li'iddati hinna. Wahsul idda. La tukhriju hunna. Four opportunities to continue on with the marriage in this one ayah. Then comes the fifth one. Because even then it may be talaq raj'i. So even at the end of this period, there is still opportunity to return back. Five. And then sixth. لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا. You don't know that Allah himself may intervene to bring about reconciliation between the two of you. Six times within the ayah, 
Allah gives opportunity to preserve the family unit. Tell me, although it's called Surat At-Talaq, did you know that there's a second name in the Ahadith for this Surah? It's called Surat An-Nisa As-Sughra. The chapter for women, but the smaller chapter regarding women. Does it suggest here Talaq? It's suggesting here means of avoiding Talaq. Means of preserving the family unit. And this is great wisdom from the Quran in Ahlul Bayt. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. This last part of the ayah is mentioned on different occasions in the Quran as well. La tadri la allaha yuhdithu ba'da thalika amra. You do not know that Allah may after that bring about union between the two of you. Now here, the ayat in other verses of the Qur'an give rise to the techniques of how to cause reconciliation between husband and wife. And I want to just go through these very quickly tonight to raise this topic as part of the way in which we can foster that reconciliation within the two. Please open your Qur'ans to chapter number 4, Surat An-Nisa, verses 34 and then 35. Verse number 34 is one of the most debated ayat of the entirety of the Qur'an. And unfortunately has received a very bad reputation because of its misunderstandings. It is famously, Allah Hamak, it is famously referred to as the wife beating verse. Have you heard this term? Because in the ayah, there is discussion about the issue of domestic violence, which we will talk about, inshaAllah. But because people focus so much on this part of the verse, or another part of the verse, they often miss the wisdoms that are being mentioned in the ayah itself in regards to reconciliation. Have a read of the ayah with me, inshaAllah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعدهم على بعض Men are granted a degree of responsibility above women by virtue of what Allah has made them to spend out of their properties. As you know, husbands and fathers have the duty of wajib infaq, wajib nafaqa that men and husbands and fathers have to financially provide all the basis of a home. That includes the rent or the mortgage. That includes all the necessary bills for food, clothing, water, medicines, anything like this. For not only wife and for children as well. وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَنْوَالِهِمْ فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ The good women are therefore obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah has guarded. Now, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ فُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعِذُوهُنَّ وَحْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَذَاجِعِ and as to those as to whom you fear sin, if there is a sin from one side to another, if neither of them uphold their marital duties towards the other, then there are ways in which to be able to deal with this. The first is to admonish, to speak to your partner, to raise the subject matter that you are not happy, that you want to be able to talk through the problems that are between yourselves. Then you can separate from your sleeping places. Now here, this becomes actually a little bit of a trope, especially in Western culture. When the husband messes up or does something bad, it is famous that he is made to sleep on the couch. Yeah, so he grabs the pillow and he sleeps on the couch. A few murmurings on to my right. We know this very well. We'll talk after, brother, don't worry. So, the Qur'an recommends 
separating from your sleeping places. It is not like it is in the Western culture, that the husband is supposed to sleep on the couch and then, you know, the next day he puts the pillow back on the bed and they, you know. The Quran states that when you separate, it is supposed to be purposeful and not purposeless. In the order of the ayah, it comes after admonishment, after speaking to one another. The point of the matter is this, that at the first place when a problem arises between husband and wife, they are supposed to be able to speak to one another about the issues that they are facing. If that doesn't work, if that doesn't reconcile them, then they may separate from their sleeping places. The meaning of this is, that when they separate from their sleeping places, that they are actually supposed to go and get the need and the support that they require in order to be able to come back to one another. That is the meaning of the ayah. I'll give you an example. One of the cases that we dealt with very recently. Don't worry, it's not from this community, so you, can, you don't have to hold your breath. Okay. One of the cases we dealt with very, very recently husband and wife of 10 years and they also have children may Allah bless them after 10 years they decided that they wanted to separate they came to us and talked about through their problems and the husband may Allah bless him in the first phone call he said this to me Allah is my witness he said 80% of the problems are down to me not me, Jafar, him. Okay? 80%, sometimes Majalis can go that badly, we cause problems between people. No. He goes, 80% of the problems are down to me, 20% down to her. Brilliant. Can you identify what the 80% is and 20%? Yes. So these are the things that she doesn't like. These are the things I don't like about myself, what I do. These are the 20% that I think she does. And I spoke with her as well. And she said the same things. When he said, I have these problems, she had these problems, she said the same. Amongst them, in regards to the, the husband, may Allah bless him, he said, I have a rage problem. And it became violent. I have a rage problem. I'm abusive. I say things that I shouldn't. I act how I shouldn't. I have a heavy hand. I'm violent towards my wife and towards my children. So he is telling me this and she is telling me this. Brilliant. They have now separated. Look what the ayah says. If you can't admonish one another, it doesn't work. It doesn't speaking to one another doesn't work. Separate from one another. The separation isn't just for the purpose of separation. It is to help with coming back. So we said to the brother, will you go to counseling? Will you go to therapy to help you with your rage, to stop you with your practices of domestic violence? No. No? Why not? His view was, that if you go to a counsellor, then it costs too much money. You see, it costs, doesn't it? How much is a, a professional counsellor? can be hundreds of dollars per hour, potentially. It's not cheap. I said to him, Tayyib, no problem. What if I guarantee you zero cost? For example, we will find someone to pay it. They were in a financial situation. They couldn't pay for it, counsellor. So his objection was, no, too, too expensive. What if I find you someone to cover the costs? No. Why not? I said to him, we have someone in the community, professional, Shia, knows the issues of our own community dynamic, our own Shi'i dynamic. No, this person probably knows us and will end up talking about us. No problem. If I find you from someone outside the community, will you go? Still no. Every time we raised a solution, the answer was no. The ayah is telling us when you separate, if there are problems that need to be dealt with, it is not separation just for the sake of separation. There has to be work that is put in to be able to reconcile the marriage. May Allah bless him. Do you know what the brother said at the end of this conversation? He said, I also want to go through with the divorce. Can you imagine now you're willing to stand before Allah on the day of judgment and say that rather than going for free counseling, 
for the thing that you said 80% of the problem is on me, you would rather stand before Allah on the day of judgment and go for a divorce than actually deal with the problems at hand. And I tell you this story why. But sadly, this is often the case within our communities. That they would rather, especially the brothers, they would rather not go for counseling and deal with the issues at hand than go. They would rather not have the support than have the support. Why? Because they feel like there's some sort of shame in this. No, brother. It is a shame to arrive on the day of judgment splitting a family with children than not actually taking care of one's own soul and the responsibilities that you have. The famous hadith from Imam alayhi salam is what? That it is permissible to divorce, but there is no thing which is more hated with Allah than this, such that it even shakes the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he makes this suggestion is, the separation, purposeful, not purposeless. Return back to your Qur'ans, inshallah. Move to verse number 35. So if one side or both sides need counseling for the issue with the separation of the beds, this is recommended. Even still, there is recommendation for both parties to sit with each other with trained counselors, with family members who are just, who can speak on their behalf and help them to be able to navigate or negotiate the issues together. Verse number 35. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِسْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا Incredible ayah. And if you fear a breach between the two of them, then appoint a judge or witnesses or guides or helpers, one from his side and one from her side. Even better is two people. Why? So that there's two witnesses to each conversation or two from each side and not one witness. Because if one person comes from your side of the family and one comes from her side of the family, it could be that they say things and that, you know you need another person to be there present to be a just witness to what was said. Look at this part of the ayah. In yurida islahan yuwaffiqillahu baynahuma. If they both desire reconciliation, the husband and the wife, Allah Himself will bring this about. Look at the condition. If both of them. Now there are many, many ahadith from Ahlul Bayt wasalam, regarding the importance of reconciliation and even how a community ought to organize itself in regards to having reconciliation for two. One hadith comes to us from Imam, it doesn't say which Imam, but the hadith says from Imam alayhi salam. Ma amila rajulun amalan ba'da iqamatil fara'id khayran min islahi bainan nas. There is no better thing for a person after his fara'id, after his wajibat, after your salah and your sawm and your khums and your wajib hajj than actually bringing about reconciliation between two people. That's how highly recommended it is. This hadith comes to us from our sixth imam, but as you recite the salawat, please all of us take a couple of steps forward. Our sixth imam, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salawat, Allahu salamuhu alayhi. Ahsantum. <laughs> <laughs> This hadith is really crucial. Please listen to this hadith and, and understand the depth of this hadith. Especially for those of you who are uh, community leaders and you are dealing with the purse strings of the community. Imam alayhi salam says, this is the sixth Imam alayhi salam. إِذَا رَأَيْتَ بَيْنَ اثْنَيْنَ مِنْ شِيْعَتِنَا مُنَازَعَةً فَافْتَدِهَا مِنْ مَالِي if you see two Shia having argument, having problem between themselves, deal with them, organize reconciliation from the, for them from my wealth. 
Imam alayhi salam had a section of his own personal wealth that he set aside as a means to financially facilitate reconciliation between his two Shia. Think about this. When we talk about the issues of khums or sadaqah and we raise money from the community for community needs, what did the first hadith say? There is nothing better after your wajibat than bringing reconciliation between people. Imam then said, from my money, from Imam's money, there should be a fund which goes towards reconciliation. Imagine now when you're getting ijazah from Khums, if you're asking for ijazah, what do you want to use your ijazah for? Yes, we can build beautiful buildings. But if there's no cooperation between the people inside the buildings, what use is the building? We have to be able to even have a space within our funds for means of reconciliation for people who cannot afford it. Next hadith comes to us again from our sixth holy Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa Sadaqatun yuhibbuha Allah islah bayna al-nas idha tafasadu wa taqarab baynahum idha taba'adu Sadaqa you giving charity, you giving from your own pocket in the name of Allah in order to bring about people back together if they have spoilt, if they have caused mischief and to bring them closer together if they have distanced themselves from one another. Can you see how important it is not only to have reconciliation but even the organization of reconciliation within the community? To have access to professionals, elders who are experienced, ulama that are experienced, that can navigate these issues on behalf of the families that might actually be causing this. Return back to the ayah and we conclude, insha'Allah. يُرِيدَ إِسْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا If the two of them genuinely desire reconciliation, Allah will bring it about. Can you see how important the family unit is to Allah? That He says... I will enter into the issue myself. But the condition is what? That the two of them genuinely seek reconciliation. We were involved with one divorce, one dispute. Two of them came. And the issue was that the brother was not happy with the sister in terms of some religious issues. Not praying, not wearing hijab, this, that. Question to the brother, what do you want? I want her to start wearing her hijab, perform her salah, you know, come to the mosque. The dhururiyat of the deen, the essentials, the foundations of the deen. Question, brother, if she does these things, will you then genuinely continue on with the marriage? Will you want it? He sat for a while, thinking, thinking, thinking. You know what? No. My heart's not there anymore. That's fine. Be honest. It would have been worse to do what? To say, yeah, make her jump through all these hoops, start doing this, start doing this, start do drag it out, and then at the end of it, my heart's still not there. I still don't want her. No matter what she does for me, I'm still not happy. That would have been worse, wouldn't it? You're playing with people's lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you genuinely want reconciliation, if it's still there within you, you put that forward to Allah, both of you, and you'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the two of you back together. Can you imagine? Allah is looking for what here? Taqwa. Adala. If you are honest and fair and kind and compassionate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will intervene to be able to bring about the reconciliation. Can you see within these few ayat how many times Allah Jalla Jalaluhu works to preserve the family unit? And this is so many different examples of how you and I can go towards this path, insha'Allah. The extent of the patience that was in Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. is unrivaled in human history. There is one narration that talks about the patience of Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
once after the martyrdom of Lady Fatima alayhi salam, Imam buried Lady Fatima salamullahi alayha in the darkness of the night in order to protect her body and keep it secret from the tyrants. This hadith is mentioned in the book of Shaykh al-Mufid alayhi rahma. He says that after he buried Fatima salamullahi alayha, and he announced that she had been buried. The second tyrant comes to him and says, why did you bury her in secret? This was her will. She did not want anyone to know where she is buried. The second caliph says, if you don't tell me where she is buried, I will attack you and I will force you to tell me where she is buried such that I will dig up the corpse of Fatima the Zahra and I will then perform janazah over her and re bury her where I want to bury her. This is mentioned in the books of Hadith. Can you imagine? Umar ibn al-Khattab is threatening to dig up the corpse of Fatima the Zahra. Do you know what Ali ibn Abi Talib does? He unsheathes his sword and says, This is Zulfiqar. If you take a step forward by Allah, I will unleash this sword upon you. Do you know what our commentators say? They say this is the extent of the patience of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because in all of the events, this was the first time that he had threatened violence upon this response. When they attacked the house, he didn't. When they martyred Fatima to Zahra, he didn't. When they stole Fadak, he didn't. This was the extent of the patience within Ali ibn Abi Talib. But now I want you to understand that the patience of Ali ibn Abi Talib, it is so difficult for him, such that as he is lying on his deathbed and the poison is running through his body, he is moving and shifting his body from the left into the right, moving his feet up and down because of the pain that he is suffering from the amount of poison that is running inside his body. One narration says that there was a clamber outside of his house. The widows are wanting one last ziyara of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The orphans are wanting one last ziyara of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who is going to look after us after this day? It is said that Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had so many throngs of well wishes and people coming to visit him that he had to close the door and say, No more can anyone see. After all of Ahl al Kufa had departed back to their house, the narration says that Asbagh bin Nubata knocked upon that door. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam opened the door and said, Oh Asbagh, I know that you are amongst the closest of companions, but my father is in the state. He cannot see anyone. Asbagh said, I beg you in the name of Ali, allow me to have one last ziyara of my master. Imam al Hassan allowed Asbagh, maybe this is the last companion to see Ali ibn Abi Talib alive. Asbagh narrates, he says, When I went into that room, I was so shocked at what I saw. I saw my master, the one who was usually so strong, kicking his feet in pain, and there was a bandage around his head. It had green pus coming out of it from the amount of poison that was running in the body of him. I began to cry so much. Ali looked at me and said, Oh, Asbah, why are you crying? Your imam is still alive. Ibn Asbah responds, he says, Oh Imam, how can I not cry in this moment knowing that this is the last time I will see my Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib? Allah <laughs> la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina dhalamu ayyuman qalabi yanqalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Matima Hussain, ya Hussain Matima Ali, ya Ali Ya Ali.
ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai humse bichda hai maula hamara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara khake be warisi hai saro par kale parcham lage hai garo par khake be warisi hai saro par kale parcham lage hai garo par humse bichda hai maula hamara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibn muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibn muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai sab ye 19vi ke si aayi khume duba muhammad ka bhai sab ye 19vi ke si aayi khume duba muhammad ka bhai ro raha hai sahar ka sitara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai ibn mulk मत के दिन है इब्ने मुलजिम ने है दर को मारा इब्ने मुलजिम सितम के सढ़ाया कब्र में सैयदा को रुलाया इब्ने मुलजिम सितम के सढ़ाया कब्र में सैयदा को रुलाया कैसे बच्चों का होगा गुजारा रोजा दार हो कयामत के दिन है इब्ने मुलजिम ने है दर को मारा रोजा दार हो कयामत के दिन है ibne muljim ne hai dar ko mara roza dar ho qiyamat ke din hai muhammad wale muhammad salawat we have about one sheikh elders brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum uh thank you sheikh for taking the time to host this Q&A and this discussion, and inshallah, we'll get some benefit. Um, as a reminder, for those uh, in the audience who would like to ask questions, please make sure the questions are related to Sheikh's topic of discussion in his lectures, which is the commentary of Surah Talaq. Um, and I can kick us off with a question, inshallah. Um, and it's more of a process-related question than a content-related question. Um, when you look at a verse, like verse number one of Surah Talaq, and you identify there's one particular word that Allah is using, and when you have, you gave a series of three different lectures on the things that uh, one has to do before uh, getting to the point of divorce, just based off one singular word. So in deriving kind of that uh, reasoning, that idea of what we can glean from just one word how, how do you do that when you're reading the holy quran bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim wa salli ya rabbi ala khilatika min khalatik muhammadin wa alihi at-tahirin awaited savior imam al-mahdi alayhi salam 
my respected teachers, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Such a lovely question. May I ask you a question back? Yes, please. Um, I'm given to understand that you are in the field of patent law. That's true, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> if there was one word in a contract and this threw up multiple possibilities, how would you approach that word? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, context is very important. Context. Um, the intention of the authors drafters, or the yeah. drafters, or the signers at the time when they were signing it. Absolutely. What yeah. else? Oh, man. I think you I would think look you at, for example, the language itself, right? Yeah. There, there would obviously be either grammatical or linguistic principles that you would revert back to. What else? Uh, plain meaning versus what you can kind of derive yes. from the words. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, from the perspective of the Quran, we uh, look at the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, if you or I draft a contract, we have uh, comparable, li you know, limited wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has layer after layer after layer inside both the apparent and inside the inner meanings, the exoteric and the esoteric meanings as well. So <clears throat> one of the benefits that we have in uh, Shi'i and Sunni tafsir is that we can actually take from um, 1400 years of tradition. So over the span of 1400 years, imagine multiple commentators addressing the same subject, the same words, from various different angles, from various different influences. It may be that some look at it from a very legalistic perspective, some look at it from a social perspective, some of it look from a spiritual perspective. When we read various tafasir and mufassirin opinion, um, we're actually able to appreciate the, the breadth of the surah from multiple angles. Um, our teacher, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi Al-Mudarasi, may Allah grant him a long life, he often says, this is one opinion, this is another, this is another. None of them are wrong. In fact, it's like the sun shining on different parts of the day. You know, sometimes as the sun is overhead, this part will be lit up more. As the sun rises or sets, this side will be lit up more. He says the Qur'an is like this. Different commentators will explain the same issue from different angles and you can benefit from them all. So this is how often we have to prepare. We look at it from various different angles um, and that gives us the, the, the breadth of what we think the ayah might be saying. Awesome. Do we have any questions from uh, anybody in the audience who would like to ask related to Sayyid's topic of discussion? Oh, we'll start with the ladies. I didn't mean to put you on the spot earlier. <laughs> That's okay. I think you know my job better than I do. No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I was hoping to learn from you. I didn't have an answer. I was like, tell me, what, what does a patent lawyer do? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, so my question is relating to trauma. So um, for a lot of us, right, our families come from like um, East Africa, like Uganda, and they left because of war. Um, so obviously they, seeing war and all the brutality from that, there's a lot of trauma. Um, is there anything in your experience that you've seen, um, I guess, like how, if there is generational trauma, how, how do we prevent that and how can we work on that? And like, is there anything we can help like our families overcome that? Because it is a lot, right? Like what they went through and whatnot. Um, yeah. I said, um, this of course is outside of my expertise. It requires professionals and therapists um, to, to, to look into the root of the trauma, how it's being expressed, how the family unit can help. Um, so it, it, it's beyond me to comment um, fr from a professional perspective. Just in terms of experience of you know, dealing or seeing different communities, um, there's various different uh, ways depending on the age or the circumstance of the individual who has that trauma could be art therapies, um, it could be um, family um, sitting together and talking and actually hearing from one another about how to overcome these uh, particular things. So one of the traumas that you, you highlighted, our community uh, ends up having is being refugees, especially those from the Ugandan communities. Um, 
some of those from the Zanzibarian communities as well, has directly seen revolutions, traumas being thrown out of their uh, homes. So that brings with it its own particular trauma. The, the types of traumas that tend to be most common in, in sort of um, third generation Western communities um, sometimes is things like domestic violence because their parents have been taught how to be able to bring up children and it's very different from the, 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 the social circumstances that we have nowadays. Um, and then there is also the, the one that I alluded to as well of sort of uh, the addictions to pornography and these sorts of things as well. So each one is so diverse, it requires its own area of speciality or focus on. So it probably be on me to give a blanket answer um, but if there's a specific or there's a spiritual side or an akhlaqi side, then we have many, many books that have been written on how to be able to deal with some of these things from an akhlaqi perspective. So it's back to you. I don't know if you mean something specific or if you are talking in more general terms. Um, it was more in general terms, but also like, for example, our, um, our fourth imam, he saw his family, you know, massacred and... Um, obviously, that is, you know, beyond our capacity to imagine what he went through. So, is there any like hadith or stories of like how he overcame, you know, what he saw and like live his life? Because obviously, he was, you know, the best examples, and he didn't resort to, you know, violence and whatnot. Ascent. Um, the entire tradition of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam appears to be a response to what he saw and what he experienced. So from one perspective, you have the aza and the grief that he showed, which became a sunnah in and of itself to be able to cry for Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. So this is opposite to sort of the um, neo-Salafist movement that forbids the idea of emotional expression, going to the graves, crying, lamenting, even things like ma'tam, as you know, would not be permissible. From the imam's perspective, this is encouraged as a means. Poetry and actually writing down and speaking about what occurred is another sunnah as well from Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Probably the most powerful one is his Sahifa as sajjadiyah where you can see that with all of the different events that he has been surrounded by, he finds a way to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about those things. Right? Um, so these are specifically from the examples of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, I will jump in with my own question, Please. Uh, selfishly, uh, curbing the audience here. But um, so you mentioned uh, one of in one of your lectures that part of what we learn from this discussion is about extended family units and the value and the benefit of being in extended family units. Especially, you cited some studies as well uh, about how that can be beneficial for education and literacy uh, and all that good stuff. Um, <laughs> my question is: Is there any sort of uh, lessons we can glean from prophetic tradition or from? Uh, traditions of our imams of how they lived uh, in extended family units and kind of where we can learn from their example. And the second part of my question is for all practical purposes, what does it mean to have an extended family unit with you? Does it mean that you necessarily live with your extended family? Does it mean that you make frequent visits to your extended family? Or for just in a practical sense, what does that mean? Bismillah um, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When you were asking about um, uh, methods of tafsir earlier on, what we tend to now do is have an opportunity to look back into the Quran and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents these topics or if he answers these questions. So the famous ayat, for example, of where Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam were fasting together for three days. right? As you know, Imams Hassan and Hussein. Salamallahu alayhi ma wa unwell. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam took another that they would, she would fast in order to make them well. The entire family unit fasted. And then for three nights, um, different people came to the door and they offered their food. The, the principle about this 
about the extended family unit is that you've got three generations, the Prophet, Imam Ali, Lady Fatima, Imam Hassan and Hussein, Salamullahi alayhi wa and they are all doing the same activity together. So the extended family unit is supposed to work as the unit suggests, that it's supposed to do things together. It's supposed to experience and go places together. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives another example of how extended family units or family units are supposed to uh, work together. Uh, the f- best example is Prophet uh, Ibrahim and Ismail, salamullahi alayhima. On one occasion, uh, they are building the Kaaba together. On another occasion, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam says, I see in my dream that I am slaughtering you. Fandul madha tara. What is your opinion of this matter? Do as you have been commanded, you will find me amongst the patient, God willing. How is it that a 13-year-old boy accepted to be sacrificed at the sword of his father? The answer is, is because the Quran says that wherever Ibrahim went, Ismail would follow him. So father and son were together. So Ismail's role model was his father. Whenever his father would go to do any amal, he would see his father do it. He would see the level of worship, he would see the akhlaq, he would see how he dealt with, com- dealt with community situations. The ayah says, فَلَمَّا uh, بَلَغَ مَعَهُ سَعْيَا When Ismail alayhi salam reached to, being ba- uh, to, be, to reach 13, to be reaching an age, مَعَهُ سَعْيَا he was with his father wherever he went. So the fact that he would go wherever he went, he would see his father enact prophetic levels of behavior. And now all of a sudden his father says to him, I see in my dream I'm slaughtering you. What's your opinion? Because he's seen his father's prophetic standards, he's followed his prophetic standards. Now... When he's put to the test, even as a 13-year-old, he can respond prophetically. Do as you have been commanded. You will find me amongst the patients. So the prophetic family unit is one of seeing the adults, mature spiritual beings, act, and then the children follow those acts. They grow up into that development. Does that make sense? Uh, Our teacher, um, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al-Mudarrasi, in his own family unit, he told us once, he said, every day, he has several kids, he said, every day, we get together, and we take it in turns, someone has to present one ayah of the Qur'an and their personal tadabbur over it. So Monday he does, Tuesday this son does, Wednesday this son does, ten minutes. They have dinner together. Whoever is in town is in town. Sometimes his sons have different programs across the country of Iraq, Iran. But let's say five of them are in town today. Three of them are in town today. Seven of them are in town today. They all get together. They have dinner. And afterwards, for five minutes, ten minutes, one says, Today, I was thinking about this ayah. Kada wa kada. He recites the ayah. He says, this is my reflection on it. That every day they do an activity together, but it's a spiritual activity that bonds them together. So this is a prophetic tradition that we're supposed to take on. The second part of your question was... Uh, you kind of did touch on it. What, kinda, what does it practically mean to be part of an extended family unit? And from what I'm understanding... Ah, you know, yes, yeah. to, to live with them or to not live with them. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> I think one of the constructive feedbacks that I got on the third night about living in extended families was... Was I suggesting that you had to live with your in-laws? The Quran gives us both examples of living with your in-laws and not living with your in-laws. Which prophet lived with his father-in-law? Ahsant. Prophet? Musa alayhi salam. We lived with Prophet? Shu'ib alayhi salam. He lived with him, even worked for his father-in-law. Uh, if I remember, the contract was eight years or ten years. So this is an example. 
In the verse that we quoted, chapter 24, verse 61, where Allah says, there's no problem if you eat from your own houses, the houses of your father, the houses of your uncles. The dalala, what it's pointing towards, is that you're not living with your parents. There's no problem eating from the house of your father, which means you have to go to your father's house in order to be able to eat, which means you're not living with your ah. Can you see, the Quran doesn't say you have to do one way or another. It doesn't say you have to live with your parents or parents-in-law, or you don't have to live with your parents and don't have to live with your parents-in-law. It's on the personal situation of the family unit. But the idea is extended family. When you have your extended family, be in contact with them, visit them, ring them, keep in touch, let them develop together. And it sounds like more so than just presence with the family, actually taking actions with the family, like the examples that you gave. Exactly, exactly. Do we have any questions from the audience? I saw a few hands raised before I took over. I think Matham had a question. Assalamu Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, uh, the ayah in the Quran Surah Rum uh, with regards to mawadda and rahma. Yes. Uh, Surah Rum, ayah number 21. It says, And of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. Yes. Um, can you help define mawadda and rahma, uh, specifically mawadda and the difference between mawadda and love. Uh, I've heard in some places uh, the translation for love is hub. So what's the difference between mawadda and hub? My understanding <clears throat> is that mawadda is even higher than hub. From the word wudud, Allah is al-wudud, from the word wud. Um, I, w I would want to check grammatically what, what is the difference between mawadda and uh, hub because I, w I don't want to speak about the Quran um, without, without preparation on it. It would not be fair. Um, so if you allow, then I could try to come back. Um, it's not something, I, it's something I wanted to talk about in the series, but I'll, I'll rather be prepared. So if you allow, it might be something that we touch on in the series itself. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so Surah Baqarah, uh, the concept of being a libas. So Surah Baqarah, verse number 187. Yes. Um, the women are garments for you. Yes. Uh, and you are garments for them. Um, so just need assistance with defining what that means from a practical standpoint. Uh, what is it? What is it not? And how best do we... Um, exhibit this verse in, in our practical lives. This is something we are definitely going to be looking at in the series, inshallah. <laughs> so uh, it'll probably come maybe in, 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 in two nights' time, was the plan. But in principle, very, very briefly, y you are supposed to be a protection for each other. And if you imagine the way in which a human being comes with all of their flaws and their faults, not only are we supposed to help each other preserve one another from their flaws and faults, we also preserve them from their flaws and their faults outside. So it's two, within the house and external to the house. If I have flaws and faults, it should not be exposed and provoked. I should be a cover for my wife and my wife should be a cover for me, a protector. And similarly, outside of the house, it should never be a discussion about the flaws of your own partner. You don't speak bad about your partner. You don't undermine your partner in front of anyone else. Very principle, and we'll talk deeper about it, inshallah. Thanks, Maytham. You're ahead of the game. You're giving us all a sneak peek here. Uh, and then we have another question from the ladies. Um, 
so the question from one of the ladies is, what if the uh, what are the examples presented from extended families that do not uphold Islamic values and are often upholding more traditional cultural values? Uh, for example, if they're encouraging not very Islamic values and encouraging emotional abuse, um, and how do we break that cycle? Could you just repeat the first part? I'm not clear about what the... Oh. Uh, what if the examples presented from extended families do not uphold Islamic values and are more cultural? Uh, and what was the example of the cultural? Um, emotional abuse. Like black, like blackmailing, right? Like only yeah, like only traditional. Hmm. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, yeah, I mean, in often cases, um, uh, I, I've seen many, many occasions where uh, the in-laws or the extended family unit is used as a means of abuse, especially upon the, the, the wife coming into the family house. I've seen uh, cases in our own Khoja community, people, uh, there was one, bless her, mother-in-law, <coughs> she used to tell her own daughter-in-law off for using, um, for using um, shampoo, too much shampoo, literally. And I I've seen WhatsApp messages of the levels of abuse where she would scream. Uh, in one place, uh, I know in London when I was a resident there, there was a father-in-law who physically hit, beat up his own daughter-in-law. So sadly, these things happen. The abuse and uh, oppression uh, can, can happen. So <clears throat> it goes back to all of the normal principles that, first and foremost, a wife has a right to her own space. There is no, she has no duty, no responsibility whatsoever towards the extended family. She has no duty towards the parents-in-law whatsoever. On the opposite, she has a right to her own space. She has a right to be the queen of her own house. And if she decides to allow extended family into that space, then by and large, it has to be on her terms. Because she has no duty towards anyone else other than her husband and her family. And the opposite goes, that her husband's primary duty is towards her. When there is need for an extended family unit to live together, which is a very good thing from the Islamic principles, from sociological principles, upbringing and nurturing principles, then it has to be done on certain terms. It's very interesting. May Allah bless, I'm giving you an example as a generality. Mother-in-law has now lived 50, 60 years of life. 40 years, 50, 60 years of life. She's had her time to be the queen of the house. She's had her time to organize the house the way she wants. She's had her time to be able to decorate the house the way she wants. If now someone else is coming into the house, or now you are moving into your daughter-in-law's house, surely it's time for a person to say, I step back and I allow another human being to ascend to the realm of experiencing what it means to run the house. To have that space, that duty, that experience, that life skill, for how long do you want to sit there and be queen bee? For how long do you need to be that person that governs everything? At what point does the bride get the opportunity to choose the curtains, to, to choose the, the dishware, to choose what they want within the house? So I think we have, in certain extended families, the principles are backwards. We think that because we are supposed to have an extended family, which I reiterate is better, because we have an extended family unit, that there's no movement of the baton. Maybe that's where the initial problem goes. And maybe we have to rethink what it means so that we don't mix up the culture with the Islam. A wife 
has the right to her space, to her privacy, to run her house. Her and her husband are the heads of the house. And anybody else who is living in that space has to respect who are the heads of the house. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the ladies before I pass it back to the gents? Yes? Alaikum. Um, my question is, what if, let's say, um, she doesn't have a duty towards certain people like or anything like that, but that expectation is there and it causes issues, but it also pushes her rights as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. How does someone go around that? So in the, in the, in the um, verse that we spoke about, the first verse of Surah At-Talaq, we highlighted the, the difference between behaviors and rights. It's like me saying this. If I go to a court, the judge is going to deliberate upon the black and white, upon the rights. Right? But before it gets to that point, we don't only work on rights, we work on behaviors. Normal etiquettes, expectations of one another. And so the ideal in this situation is to respect rights as a fundamental, but actually to communicate through what is ideal behaviors. I know it's hard, I can understand how difficult it is, sensitive, for people to balance up a living space and the demands and the needs of various people, various generations. Elders to youth to children, I understand. So that's why sometimes, if there is, it's a sticky situation, take it out of your hands. This is why the Quran gives this, you know, appoint witnesses, appoint representatives from both sides. They can sit, they can talk with the people, with people who have experience on this matter, and help illuminate where we can actually build a positive relationship as opposed to it being very dicey you know i feel like my rights are being trampled upon here i don't feel like i'm getting my space here there actually needs to be um communication which is healthy and helpful to both parties inshallah uh, you asked a general question i'm giving a general answer inshallah so what if in in certain sorry what if in like let's say a communication of course is key um, and trying to find a reasonable middle ground. But sometimes expectations when they are pushing boundaries of someone's rights, and some people aren't willing to negotiate, if that makes sense. I don't have like a specific example, but I've seen it in a lot of scenarios where um, a healthy c a communication would have to involve like a healthy mindset from both sides. And that's, that's more like idealistic. If that makes sense. No, I, I, I understand. It, 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 as I said, sometimes you end up having to revert to rights where there cannot be an agreement, where there is one person who is overstepping, one person is toxic, where there is a healthy mindset, then we go beyond rights and we have to try to elevate ourselves to positive behaviors. And so would you would a person have take their rights and there would be some grievances in this in the middle because of expectations not being met is that how does that it, it's such a broad question um if you can give me an example of expectation the thing is, is i'm like there is like four scenarios in my mind i don't know which one to say but let's say for example i can't i don't know there's just so many specific ones but like Let's say a person has a right to do something. Another person says, no, I don't want you to do this because it may be culture re cultural reasons or because they don't like it or because of their personal expectations of what, let's say, a bride has to do, let's, for example. Um, and those expectations are not being met, but the bride has a certain right to do something, right? And she, go, because there is not that communication, there is not that middle ground, there, the negotiation was not being taken place, they, that the, let's say the bride takes her right, but then there is grievances from the other family. Sure. I, I think we have to go back to the same principles 
and know the Islamic rights, no culture, and to see if the culture is impeding upon the right, then of course we have to revert back to the right. If it's something that's haram, something that's distasteful, something that's exploitative, oppressive. But again, I think I understand uh, from certain communities or generations, they place heavy, heavy importance on certain cultural practices and expectations. At that point, there needs to be someone strong enough in the middle who is able to communicate to both parties and help try to resolve it. It sounds like, I could be wrong, in the specific example that you're giving, it might be the husband or the groom that needs to be able to sit in the middle and say, this is what we want as a couple, this is what is expected from the family, and this is how we're able to navigate some of these more stickier traditions or behaviors and practices. I would say you need someone strong in the middle, and if not in the middle, then you have to have someone from the outside who knows Islam, who is capable, strong enough to be honest, just, and, and, and not forceful, but you know, put their foot down and say, this is where both sides stand, or this is the rights and responsibilities of both sides, and this is the maximum you can go to in each case. Okay, thank you. Asad, I think we'll take time for about two more questions, if that's okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the guy's side? Asalaamu As Alaikum, Sheikh. Wa Alaikum, Salaam. I think the bottom line is that if everybody has a fear of Allah and taqwa to do the right thing, the respect of the old people when they're in the home, the respect of the new bride that's coming in the home. So if everybody fears Allah and Allah is there in every action without having any tradition or any, you know, you know, you know, before thoughts and whatever, just do the right thing with the open heart and with open mind and, and you know, Allah says to respect your parents the, the groom has to respect the parents. Allah says they treat your daughter-in-law or anybody with a full open heart, like your own daughter. So, you know, if there is a taqwa in the family, I don't think there should be any issues. Okay. I think sometimes rivalries are set up uh, yeah, very yeah. early on. You're right, you're right. But, you know, if, if, if both the, the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law fear Allah and they're religious people and they want to do a right thing, with an open heart. Let, yeah. Let's not too much focus on mother-in-law, daughter-in-law as yeah, well. Yeah, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. We have, we, Otherwise... You know, whatever, you know, in the <laughs> extended family, yeah. if they're open-hearted and open communication, like you said, you know... If my father-in-law is listening to this, he'll say, what about our rivalry, you know? Yeah, you know, there uh, is He's no Arsenal one. and I'm Tottenham Hotspurs. There's a big rivalry between us. Yeah, you know, if, if, <laughs> if we have an open heart, clean heart, and, you know, <laughs> we're, and, 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 you know, it goes both, both ways. So, <laughs> you know, that's this. Any other questions regarding the Qur'an or uh, the actual surah or the methodology of the surah? Do we have any more questions from the audience? And while we wait, I will say great win for Tottenham today. Not great win. Not great. Against but, but, but a good relegation win. caliber team. Alhamdulillah. A win is a win. A win is a win is a win. <laughs> Um, Sheikh, first I just wanted to thank you for bringing this topic to our community. I think it's well needed and inshallah well received. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it's actually on the request of Sayyid Muntadar. So if it all goes wrong, you blame him. And if it all goes right, you <laughs> thank him. No, he's definitely well versed with the challenges in our community. So we thank him for this. Um, my question was, um, when you talk about the steps towards a successful marriage, one of them is... Um, dealing with any trauma before you get married. Yes. Um, speaking for my, sorry, speaking for myself or anybody who didn't have the chance to do that before marriage. Um, what are the next steps once you're married? And I, I guess that would look different based on how long you've been married and essentially the new traumas that would have resulted from not um, sorting those previous ones out. But what are the next steps? Uh, so you mean to say if you've already gotten married, but then you want to deal with some of those traumas? 
Uh, yes. So h what's the he um, healing process, right? Because those pre-existing traumas would still exist. Yes. And now you would potentially have new ones yes. um, post-marriage. So what would that process look like? It d it does it look different now that you're married? Ahsan. So the ayah that was raised earlier on by Brother Maytham, we was the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, هُنَّ uh, لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنَّ So that... Uh, the, the wives are an, a, a covering for you and you are a covering for them. A strong, healthy relationship should allow for that communication to say that although we didn't speak about these things before marriage or I didn't have chance or knowledge of how to deal with these things before, these are things that are actually arising from the marriage and they can actually occur at different stages. I'll give you an example. Um, someone who's had trauma with their own parents, that might be very deep-rooted and not come out until that person has children of their own. So when they have children and they experience something, there is a trigger that turns them back to what occurred to them in their lives 20 years ago. That has to be respected and spoken about. And then the other partner has to be a covering for the first one. If the first one raises this and says that this is happening, I'm feeling anxious, overwhelmed, worried, I'm worried about bringing this trauma into our family, whatever it may be, that communication should be strong enough to allow both partners to talk about it and then find some solutions. Again, the same solutions would have been there prior to marriage and during the marriage. It might be that the solution comes with work with your partner. The solution comes with therapy. The solution comes with experts, specialists, whatever it may be. But the, the same process needs to occur. But during the marriage, the, the partner should not um, hopefully feel fearful to raise those or feel a backlash from their partner when they raise them. Ahsan, thank you, Sheikh. Thank you for all of the insight during the session. And just as a Final wrap-up question. Uh, are there any topics coming up in the next 10 nights that you're particularly excited to talk about? I know I enjoyed the, the spouse selection and uh, Ayatollah Khamenei's interpretation of what it means to be enriched uh, by marriage. Uh, are there any topics that you are looking forward to discussing with us? Um, <clears throat> some of the topics that are coming are very sensitive and requires... Um, mature minds to, to, to navigate them. So amongst the topics that will be coming up is the issue of the wife beating verse, famous verse, it says, hunna, that you can strike your wife. What is the meaning of this and are we permitted today? After this comes a very sensitive topic. If you hit your partner, I haven't said wife, if you hit your partner, husband or wife, or your children, and you leave a mark, did you know that there's a dia for you to pay? Did you know that? And did you know every time you hit someone? So let's say you are in one argument, God forbid, and you hit them three times, and you leave three marks. There's three diyat to be paid. How much is the dia? So we will talk about this in one of the discussions as well. In the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's important that you actually pay the dues that are upon you. So kafarat and diyat have to be paid, even in divorce. So we'll talk about that. I find that very interesting and it raises a huge deal within communities. It can be very, very... Um, uh, a big issue because sometimes you actually find there's been so much spousal abuse, the diyat runs into hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's very difficult. The wisdom in this is, again, it's a means of coming penitently to your family, saying, I did wrong. I can't, I have to, f I need you to forgive me for what's happened. When forgiveness occurs, people can move forward together. So there's huge wisdom in the diya. Yeah, so I'm, I, I find it really interesting. But again, it's a sensitive topic that requires maturity. So inshallah, that's coming up in maybe the next two days.
inshallah. I think uh, all of us are definitely looking forward to that. Sheikh, thank you t so much for taking the time uh, to enlighten us and answer our questions. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for the invite for the Q&A, and I apologize if there's any shortcomings in the answers of the questions. And inshallah, we'll conclude with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum.